we did a an event we called Passport Palooza. <laughs> um, and we literally had people show up an hour before we opened because it was a full day. We didn't need to have an appointment. We had all hands on deck. We were cross treating, trying to get additional people trained um, so that we had additional capacity. But it was like, can't get an appointment anywhere else. Come down on this day. We will help you out. Um, and so we had people about an hour before who showed up with their lawn chairs um, and were just like at the front of the line, ready to go in the Courts and Admin building in Golden. Uh, but it was also a really like fun and jovial environment um, where, you know, we were just finally trying to help people get a service they need, which is ultimately what government is for, right? It's government and the clerk's office don't belong to me. They belong to all of us. And so the question I was asking is, how do we make this work better for everyone? Um, and so in that instance, it meant having a day where no one needed an appointment, they could come get their passport processed. Let's talk about creating a life and country we're proud of together. I'm your host, Alvina Vasquez. Welcome to Alvina Talks Shift. I am so excited uh, for this episode because Amanda Gonzalez, our, my own county clerk in my own county, is here. And what she does is so important, um, you know, beyond like what small business services needs, um, passports, immigration, all those things, but also running our elections office. But that's not what she's been doing for a long time. It's new to her. It's a new experience for her. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about how she got there, where, where her passion comes from. And I'm so glad to have you here, Amanda. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So let's start at the beginning. We met 10, 13 years ago. Um, you were organizing uh, a lot of organizations focused on elections and voting. And we had a monumental uh, legislation at that time that kind of changed the way that Colorado does. It definitely changed the way Colorado does elections. It set the tone really for COVID um, and how elections, we were responding, how our country was responding to elections during COVID, which is amazing that, you know, what we did at the time created that much influence. Talk about that. What was the changes that we made? And then how, how did that um, affect what was happening during COVID during elections? Yeah, I mean, in, in a good way, right? Like when we say we set the stage for COVID in a good way. Exactly. Because it turns out that what works for voters under unprecedented times is actually also what works for them in unprecedented times. So, right, what works for voters is not just voting on one single day, right? Having multiple weeks when you can fill out your ballot, being able to do that at home, right? Whether you're home because there's an international pandemic or you're home because you have a busy life and you're raising kids and you're feeding care of dogs and you have a job to get to, right? We, in Colorado, um, starting around, well, we passed the bill around 2013. Um, we made it so that every uh, eligible voter who is registered to vote um, more than eight days before the election automatically gets a ballot in the mail. So you don't have to request it. You don't have to do anything special. It just comes to you. Um, you can then take your time, talk to your friends and family, do your Google searches, decide how you feel about the issues, fill out the ballot on your kitchen table, um, and then you can either turn that ballot into any drop box in the state. Um, just to give you a reference point, we have about 37 of them throughout Jefferson County. Um, you can mail it back if that's easiest for you. Or you can go to any vote center in your county and vote in person. So we still have in-person voting. We still have early voting. Um, we have lots of services that are available at this vote center. But I think the other thing that's nice about that is you don't have to go to the one elementary school that's near your house, if you work across town, right. if you're across the state for work, you can still vote, right? Like all of these things just make sense for normal people's lives. <laughs> right. And then COVID pandemic hit yeah. and a lot of states didn't know because since we weren't allowed to be in the same room and, you know, obviously traditionally election when you go vote it's very in close proximity to other <laughs> folks and community and a lot of seniors a lot of at-risk population in big groups of folks so what did the country do how did they respond yeah I, colorado i think was uniquely prepared to handle that right because we already had this infrastructure that 
realize that people have whole lives. <laughs> they might not be able to come into their, you know, precinct voting location on one specific day. Um, and so we already had this system that like, oh, it turns out voting at home works during regular times and also works if you're doing home for COVID. Um, and so I think there were a lot of states that were calling Colorado that were scrambling to figure out how yeah. we make voting work for people when they shouldn't be leaving their homes. Um, and thankfully, Colorado already had a lot of that infrastructure set up. And, you know, that's thanks to really great election administrators, which I am now. Um, but I think it's also thanks to a lot of really hardworking advocates, which is how you and I met, right. you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, you know, these, these policies don't just magically appear, right? It's usually a lot of uh, people both inside and outside the government who are saying, this is what our community needs. This is what we need to do to make sure that everybody's voice is heard, right? But what does that mean to you? As a Latina, I mean, I'm imagining you're probably the first Latina uh, county clerk in Jefferson County. Um, when you're able to open those doors for folks that didn't traditionally have that, maybe they had the right, but they didn't feel empowered to use that right. How mm -hmm. does that make you feel that you're delivering on that? It's so important. It's the whole reason I ran for office. It's the whole reason I was doing the work that I was doing at various nonprofits previously that... I mean, <laughs> we all, I think, can get a little frustrated with some of the things happening in our world, right? Or I get really frustrated when I feel like it's one homogenous group of people making all the decisions for everyone else, right? Even right. though we know that we need everyone's lived expertise if we're going to have policies that work for all of us, right? Like, I started um, an advisory, a resident advisory group um for the clerk's office because I realized like I am one person and I do my very best to listen to all different kinds of people but I have my lens right and it's limited because I am one person and so we mm -hmm. started this group um we have about three dozen members our youngest member I think is 16 our oldest is in their 70s um all different walks of life all different backgrounds and that's really important because we're not going to get policies right um, if, if we have just a homogenous group of people or one person making them. And so, yeah, it feels really damn cool um, to know that I am helping facilitate that, that I am helping facilitate people's voices being heard, they get to have a say in their community. And hopefully that means that we get better policies because of Right. And not only that, but you're able to see obstacles that other people can't. Yeah. I mean, a, a story that, that I've, I've told, um, but I, I think it is really important. One of the things, I get to do a lot of really important work. Um, a couple of things that I do. One is that um, most Coloradans drop off a ballot that's mailed to them. They really like drop boxes. They're safe. They're secure. You know your ballot got there. You don't have to have a stamp. Um, I am ultimately the person in Jeffco that decides where those drop boxes are. Can you get to it if you're in a low-income community? Can you get to it if you're in a brown or black community? Can you get to it if you don't have a car, right? If you're somebody who's usually taking public transit. If those drop boxes are only in one neighborhood um, or only in one place, that's inequitable. Mm -hmm. I'm just sort of making sure that that happens. Oftentimes, election administrators are like, oh, let's put more drop boxes where the most popular ones are. I'm asking questions like, where are the places we're not getting ballots back? Right? And right. what are the systemic barriers to that? Can we change some of them? Um, another important piece of the work that I'm overseeing is training our election judges. Um, our election judges are amazing. These are the people that are the poll workers when you go vote. They're the people that pick up your ballot. It's all done in bipartisan teams. So we need all different kinds of people. But um, I would always vote in person, um, especially when I was running a voting rights nonprofit. <laughs> and I was, <laughs> I was sort of, you know, testing the system. And I would always bring a non-traditional ID. Uh, Colorado takes 16 different kinds of IDs when you vote in person. And so most people, you know, bring a, a state ID or a driver's license. And that's great. 
Um, but if you don't have a state ID or a driver's license, they can be kind of tricky to get. Yeah. And so I would always bring, you know, my utility bill or my bank statement. And I get there one year and I'm voting in a location where you walk in the door and you go right to go to a um, police precinct and you go left to go voting. Um, so that's what we got to buy, right? Yeah, that's kind of scary. Yeah. And so I go in and I want to give this poll worker or this selection judge all kinds of grace because I'm certain that this man meant no malice. I think he was probably trained several weeks earlier. Uh, we all know that we have bias, right? And I think yeah. that that's what happened. But he wasn't able to find me um, in the poll box. And he's like, are you sure this is the address that you registered at? And I was like, yeah. You know, this poor man has no idea that, like, I wrote some of these laws. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, he's like, have you voted at this address before? And I was like, yep, yeah, I sure have. We'll just keep looking. And he's like, I think you're going to need to re-register to vote. And I was like, well, I don't have the right kind of ID for that. Um, so let's just, I'm sure I'm going to be able to He's getting kind of flustered. And he says in a voice that was loud enough for other people in the polling center to turn their head. I mean, are we even a citizen? Wow. And it made my heart skip a beat, right? Of like, do you feel safe? You certainly don't feel welcome. Like, I think if I had not been a voting rights attorney who train up, trains other attorneys in election law, like, I probably would just typed up my big statement and walked out the door and maybe not voted that day, right? Um, it was fine. I said, nope, I, I am definitely a citizen. Let's just keep looking. He was able to find me. I was able to vote. But, you know, those are the kinds of things that, that happen. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that is a lived experience that maybe clerks before me in Jefferson County haven't had. And so it is top of mind when I think about how do we make sure that every eligible voter feels welcome? And how do we make sure that we're training those election judges so that they can bring their best selves, even when something confusing or the thing right. like it flusters them? Oh my God. What a crazy story. But, um, that's amazing work, but the county clerk oversees so much more of our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I know you've been doing some really innovative stuff that you've described to me that I would really love to talk about, specifically passports. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I had such a, uh, I had to get one for my son, which was complete, was very difficult at the time. And so <laughs> the photos uh, for the little ones are just like the best on passports. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> but talk about what you implemented, but and talk about it in a way like you had to bring your whole team along with you to do it. Like mm -hmm. I think this is a thing that you know big uh, big thinkers, big uh, change makers. You have to go in when you have a, a position like yours where you're influencing policy and how that's implemented and you get thrown into bureaucracy like passports and you try to change it. What was that like? How did you get people to come along with you and what did you do? Because it was such a cool idea. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and to your point, I think that there is something about learning to govern when the system wasn't built for you, right? Right. That, um, you know, I, I am the first Latina, I'm the first out by person. And that is for a reason, right? These, these spaces were not always welcoming and were sometimes downright hostile to people, mm -hmm. right? To women, to out people, right? And so almost anything that is new, or different, um, I think the bureaucracy of it all can have a reaction to, um, and maybe yeah. a stronger reaction because that policy, that idea, that change that's already made me a little uncomfortable is coming from somebody who's a different kind of person in the role, right? Right. And I think we absolutely need that. Like that is the kind of leadership that we need in these positions for, for a changing world. Um, and yeah. I will tell you that that being that person 
um, is often uncomfortable and takes a lot of courage. And I think I have internal dialogues with myself and with my staff that I don't think white men have the same conversations about, ooh, I just got this email back that feels really hostile <laughs> about my new idea. <laughs> right? right? What, is, what is the way that I want to respond to this that is authentic to me, that still feels courageous, that, that isn't mean, um, and is going to have folks within the bureaucracy continue to work with me in a way that I need them to. Right? Like, yeah, that is its own kind of exhausting exercise. Well, and bureaucracies are like a machine. They're just a machine. And so when folks have that mindset, it's like you're throwing a wrench in the machine when really you're just trying to improve it. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we, um, I am, we were, when I came into office, uh, folks were having a very hard time getting passport appointments. I think that's still the case, yeah. but it's gotten a little bit better. Um, and this was really stressful because if you're a family that's planning travel, you're trying to go see, you know, you're out of the country family for holidays or whatever, it can be stressful if you're like, what do you mean? I've been calling every day and trying to get an appointment for my passport. It's like worse than a Taylor Swift ticket. Like, what does this mean? Yeah, it's really hard. Being my mom at Christmas, right? Um, and so... We did a an event we called Passport Palooza, <laughs> um, and we literally had people show up an hour before we opened because it was a full day. We didn't need to have an appointment. We had all hands on deck. We were cross treating, <laughs> trying to get additional people trained um, so that we had additional capacity. But it was like can't get an appointment anywhere else. Come down on this day. We will help you out. Um, and so we had people about an hour before who showed up with their lawn chairs. Um, and we're just like at the front of the line, ready to go in the courts and admin building in Golden. Uh, but it was also a really like fun and jovial environment um, where, you know, we were just finally trying to help people get a service they need, which is ultimately what government is for, right? It's government and the clerk's office don't belong to me. They belong to all of us. And so the question I was asking is, how do we make this work better for everyone? Um, and so in that instance, it meant having a day where no one needed an appointment, they could just come get their passport processed. It was, I mean, if you think about, I mean, it's an amazing community event, but also like people lose income when they're waiting in line to do things like that, even to vote. Like if, 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 if we didn't have the flexibility to vote, if you didn't do the passport palooza, and people are trying to set appointments and be there like they lose income because they're not working that day or they have to take a day off or, um, you know, they they're running between kids and schools and parents. And it's it, I think um, it's so innovative and simple what you did. It's such an amazing idea. I mean, obviously, for us, we. Um, we don't lose income when we have to wait in line for something. We're very privileged in that, but a lot of people do. And a lot of people that are trying to just get the, go like use the, get their government documents that they need to do so they can travel and see family or whatever, or whatever thing. But that's, and that's any of our offices, right? So the clerk's office, it, I ran because I wanted to make sure that every eligible voter was able to vote and have their ballot counted. Um, but I also oversee five motor vehicle offices, our clerk to board department that does passports, recordings of things like your real estate documents, and also where the office that you come to if you're getting married. And any of those things, right? If you have to wait a really long time, if the clerk yeah. is giving you a hard time because they're having a hard time with your access, if you know, you are a larger person and you're not able to sit in the chair that's at that office, right? There's all these sort of subtle things yeah. that signal to us, are you welcome here? Right? And, you know, my sons think it's hilarious when they get their registration for their car, their little annual bill notice, and it has my name on it now. And it's like, since when did my friends send me bills? Right. But <laughs> that's, those are sort of the, <laughs> the less sexy parts of the job it's not it's not voting and saving our democracy which are the things that I was really passionate about but it is making sure that people have a path to at a minimum get what they need 
but hopefully engage deeper, right? Civic engagement isn't just voting, right? If you are eligible to vote, please get out there, register and vote. <laughs> um, but it also might mean having a say in, you know, what your community spends money on, right? Is it sidewalks? Is it yeah. libraries? Is it trash cleanup? Yeah. Whatever is important to you. Um, are your roads safe to drive on? Do you know how to navigate the systems? Are you able to get the document around your real estate when your partner passes away? Right? It's, it's all of those things that are maybe a little bit more mundane, but really, really important when we think about what government is supposed to do and the way we welcome or don't welcome people because I want them to have a positive experience voting, a positive experience at their motor vehicle office. And then hopefully they're like, right. whoa, how do I get a little bit more involved? Right? Like I have good ideas. How do I make sure that the county knows about them? Yeah. And um, I think people get such a negative connotation, you sure. know, when they think of like, oh, going to the DMV or, you know, having to register to vote or getting my passport. And really, it's like, that's their, like, your office, all of these bureaucracies, they're there to serve us. Like, they should be a, com there should be a comfortable place to sit. There should be, like, you know, resources for hearing impaired or speech impaired or translation services. So I just, uh, I think it's amazing that you think of those little things that create a home in the community for folks. Okay, so we talked about work, but I really want to talk about you <laughs> so here we are you're like kicking ass taking names how did you get here where were your humble beginnings and what were your major lessons that like pushed you through the hardest times yeah I think um one of the things that that people ask about I think in our in our work world is you know how did you get involved blah 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 and my, so um, I grew up in suburbia in California and went to school my whole life in portable buildings, um, right? Like trailers. I don't, I don't know what you call those things. Uh, yeah. 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 We had those mobile classrooms. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which like mobile classroom feels generous for how the inside of those things like. Smell. I know <laughs> they were terrible. Yeah. They're the worst. But so my community, I was in like third grade, I think. And there was a bond measure, measure G, uh, to get school funding so we could build like a real school. And, you know, I remember going from like lawn chair to lawn chair at my brother's like, you know, little kid soccer game or baseball game or something, um, asking people to vote yes on measure G. Um, wow. You know, we didn't... That's so cool. I didn't know that story. <laughs> if there was van then, you would, we definitely did not have a walk list. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's possible that our lack of strategy is one of the reasons that Measure G failed. <laughs> but, you know, I do remember being like, we need money for the school to be built um, and asking parents to, like, get out and vote. Um, the funny thing is I would have I was doing that with my mom and um, I have been a Democrat my whole life. I'm pretty darn progressive, actually. And um, my folks are pretty conservative Republicans. Um, I am a licensed attorney. I have never represented anybody who's been documented. And my brother is a border patrol agent. Um, yeah. So, yeah, family holidays are wild. <laughs> but, you know, people will often ask me, like, oh, how did, how did you, how did you like your politics come to be? Um, but I think it's, and I think it skips a generation. Um, my grandparents were immigrants and union workers. Um, yeah. But I also think it's a like core belief in fairness, right? Like, yeah. I don't know if that was just that 90210 Donna Martin graduate at the time that just lives in all of us now. But it is, it is definitely in me of what is fair, what is right, how do we systems that actually work for everybody um whether i'm going lawn chair to lawn chair to little league game or running bra <laughs> so what do people not know about you because you know a lot of people you're very well connected <laughs> but a lot of times those relationships can be superficial mostly because we're running around we don't have time to like 
you know, invest. We know we got each other's back. But what's something people don't know about you that you want them to know? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the answer I was going to give you is like, oh, I don't know if that's what I want to know necessarily. But <laughs> <laughs> um, there are really like two ways that I can really turn my brain off. Um, I'm actually really, I, there's a whole bunch of substance use in my family, I think with a lot of families. And so I, I actually didn't drink at all until I was year 30, um, just because it's kind of a scary idea to me. And so I really try, like, sometimes this is a stressful job. Sometimes life is stressful. And I, I try not to like have that be wine, even though I really do enjoy a good cast. Yeah. Um, but I love live music. I go to a ton of it. Um, and the other way I turn my brain off is like pretty crappy reality TV. Um, I, you know, probably shouldn't admit that I'm like a regular on the Sister Wives Reddit forum. I um, mean, I only got into Sister Wives because you told me you were into it. <laughs> and now I'm obsessed. <laughs> well, I think it's also just sort of interesting commentary on like the human condition, right? Some, some reality TV. It is super interesting. Truly horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but some, um, I, I, I'm a crazy dog lady. I'm obsessed with my dogs. And I, I recently lost one of the little loves of my life. And I know. I'm so sorry. You've had back to back losses. Those are so painful. It's hard. Um, but while she was sick, I watched, I exhausted the um, orders episodes that are available on whatever streaming service. And I was like, why am I finding this so comforting? And I, <laughs> part of it was like, oh, you know, here's sort of an amplified version of any of us, right? I think all of us are sort of like, oh, is it healthy? Yeah. Is it the number six I keep or whatever? Um, so like, here's sort of an amplified version of the human condition on TV and sort of watching yeah. that very predictable arc of like, what does stress look like on people? And then watching this person kind of recover from That's that. That's interesting take. Yeah. But I was like, oh, this is kind of making me feel like our chaotic world was a little bit predictable. Um, and maybe that comes in the form of sister wives and horrors. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> what is your um, pump up music? Ooh. Um, I, I, what is my pump up music? That's a great question. I feel like, you know, there was definitely a season of life where there was like a lot of Lizzo happening. Um, and I listen to a fair amount of like late nineties, early two thousands pop punk. Yeah. <laughs> so my my uh, feel good music is is pretty eclectic. Okay, so what's your take on Britney? <laughs> I had so many takes on Britney. I know. Did you read the I didn't. I mean, I, my take is. I feel horrible for her. I can't, I can't even imagine the extreme uh, living conditions that she was under, just completely oppressed. Yeah. I think it's traumatized her. I don't think she's in a good place. I don't know how anybody could be surviving any of that. I mean, I think so sad. And also, I I hope she's still getting help because I don't think she's in a good place. Yeah. I mean, the you know, dancing with knives on Instagram is concerning. <laughs> And I had to take it off my Instagram. I couldn't watch it anymore. <laughs> but even so, reading the book felt a little voyeuristic. Um, she writes in a way that sounds younger than she is, and so I often mm. felt like I was reading a young person's diary in a way right? that I'm recognizing that her feelings are real for her, and that they might not always reflect the wider world around her. And and also wondering, so my partner um, used to do some involuntary commitment work. Uh, he's also an attorney. And, you know, we have talked a lot about, again, I like systems and how do we make them fair? <laughs> like, how do you, as a community, how do you take care of each other, right? We are all going to get older and need more help. And most people will actually have some sort of relatively acute mental health thing happen during the course of their life. And so how do you create systems that don't allow what happened to her, which I think, you know, has been pretty proven to be pretty abusive. Um, oh my gosh. 
not have what happened to her and also have a, a community-wide system that does allow people to, to get what they need and to get support that they need. To get taken care of. Yeah. yeah. I don't. Oh my God. I don't think we have that. I think Brittany sort of illustrates it. I mean, I think you're right. She was probably stunted in her growth because she wasn't allowed to be other than the persona that she displayed. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sad for her. I feel like she, her life was taken away from her. And I hope, yeah, I, could, I, I mean, I agree with you. When I hear her speak, it does sound like a 13-year-old. And she's our age, yeah. right? She's in our early 40s. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I also think, you know, this is also a young woman that grew up in a really conservative area that was probably pretty homogenous. And so this sort of idea. Yeah, of, that's true. Where do you, what do you do when you grow up? I mean, I got married and divorced very young. Um, and I look back now, like I got engaged in college. So like feminist, me who's like out trying to organize and wants to change the world and is like wanting to write voting rights policy. Like that person gets married at 21. Like that's fascinating. And so, you know, when I read about her and she talks a lot about her feelings that still feel very real about like Justin Timberlake, oh, she was also kind of raised in this homogenous place where like you get married young and that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And that isn't what happened for her, you know. Which is conflicting with being a career woman, knowing like what you need to wear, how you need to look to make the money and yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you, well, we have to get together and talk more about the book because now I'm like, well, you, I'd rather hear it from you third person than read it myself. But like you've managed to have this thriving career and this family and be a mom and like do all these things that frankly sound so hard to me. Like I have dogs. I know. And they're a lot. Showing up for my pets and my partner is what, and my friends. That's a lot. Feels overwhelming sometimes when we all want to do a great job for our community. I mean, even with my dogs and my toddler, I feel like I don't give my dogs enough attention. So, you know, at night when after the baby goes to bed, I let them sit on the couch with me and stuff because I feel like it was strange because before we had the baby, I was the one that took care of the dogs and fed them, got them water, always checked on them. And now that we have the baby, Jahi's the one, my husband's the one that's always checking on them, getting them food. It's kind of like we switched. And so I feel that it's sad. I feel like a little distant from them. But I know as the baby gets older, they'll, I mean, they're all still very, the dogs are pretty young still. But it is, it is um, a part of me. Like my animals are like a part of me. They're like my babies. And how do you balance? Yeah, I, I think it's it's hard because I also, you know, know you from working sort of alongside you at various points. Um, seeing how passionate you are about the work that you do and making sure that your community is heard. And I think that often feeling like you need to take care of all these different pieces of life. Um, I head. know. And then having my parents. Oh my gosh. So much. <laughs> all right. Well, our time's up. That went by fast. <laughs> But we'll have you again soon because we have another big election coming up. Yeah. It's going to be an amazing year next year. So three elections we'll in find 2024. Out what sister wives. <laughs> now that Mary's gone, <laughs> all the women on television are finding their voices. I'm very exciting. It's a bit. It's a. It's a I know, wild it's very time exciting. To be <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Amanda. I hope you have a great holiday week and we'll talk soon. Thank you for watching Elvina Talks Shift. Please like, share, and subscribe. And as always, engage, empower, evolve. If you liked this episode, or if you want more content like this, go to elvinatalksshift.com or wherever you listen to podcasts.